a dear friend of mine, uh, a uh, agent called Richard Stone, rang me one morning to say, Ray, I've got an American producer director over here who wants to make a movie of Not Now Darling. And I said, wow. And uh, he said, w would you meet up with him? Well, I said, of course I will. Yeah, he said, OK, well, we're meeting, uh, if it's OK with you, at the Savoy Hotel, the American bar in the Savoy Hotel, at um, 12 o'clock at noon. Uh, I said, yeah, well, God, I'll be there, wow. So I all dressed up and I went there and Richard greeted me in the foyer of the Savoy Hotel and he said, oh, he's waiting in the American bar. So I said, okay. <clears throat> I said, I'm not nervous, it's okay. Not now, darling. Okay, we'll see what, we, what he's got to say. So Richard ushered me in. I went in and it was dark. And suddenly the lights went up and around the bar there, uh, wasn't an American producer, but there was uh, Moira Lister and William Franklin and Derek Nimmo and my dear friends. And I was totally shocked. And then Eamon Andrews came through the double door and said, uh, um, Ray Cooney, this is your life. And, I, and my immediate reaction, reaction was, oh my God, it's not an American film producer, oh my God. God, and I, I, I mean, my heart sank. Uh, I mean, it, and it was a terrific honour, of course, but none of that had dawned on me at the time because I was just so disappointed we weren't going to make the movie of Now Darling. But uh, anyway, um, I got over that shock uh, and uh, then thoroughly enjoyed myself. My wife had been dealing with Eamon Andrews for, you know, she could have been carrying on, on, on an affair. I mean, it was so amazing. I, I knew absolutely nothing, and I had not even a, a whiff of an idea. That's why it's so cleverly organised, that, that uh, show, that programme. And uh, Linda had had many, many conversations, not only with Eamon Andrews, but all, all those people who ended up as guests. And uh, I can, in hindsight, I could remember that um, Linda, on that morning, we were sitting up in bed, and I said, uh, I said, uh, well, God, God darn, I'm going to meet Richard Stone and talk about a movie. There's an American director over here, producer, not now, darling. Ooh, I'm nervous. And, and she started to laugh. And I couldn't, I, and, she, and I said, what are you laughing at? And she said, well, she said yeah, I'm laughing at you being so nervous when you're usually so good with people. What are you, what are you nervous? And she, but she was laughing at the irony of, of it all. And, and of course, she thought I'd be as delighted as anybody else. In retrospect, she said she found it very, very difficult because frequently she'd be on the phone to, to maybe John Chapman, uh, you know, with whom I wrote many, many plays, dear, dear friend, uh, and I might come into the room and she'd have to say something like, oh, OK then, John, yeah, no, we're looking forward to seeing you. Yeah, yeah, you bet, yeah, lovely, yeah, okay, love to Betty, yeah, bye-bye, darling. And she turned it into a, um, she's a good actress. But it did make me realise that a lot of my plays where this kind of situation happens when somebody's covering up for something, they're just so good at it. But uh, so they, they, they kind of give you time to polish yourself up, then they put you into a car, uh, and then the next thing you know, you're in the studio, uh, <laughs> going over you with a powder puff, and then you, you go on, and the, fir the first person who comes on is your wife, and then on came these lovely people who I had known over the years, some of them a very long time ago. You wonder who they're going, you know, are they going to bring up an old girlfriend or you, you don't know what they're going to do. You're thinking, what are they going to bring on? But uh, there were about two of them that were big, big surprises. Most the biggest surprise was the agent, Valerie Glynn, who uh, looked after me as a 14-year-old boy actor when I first came into the business. And she was one of the last ones to come on. And um, she was practically in tears all the time. She could hardly get anything out. And uh, apparently, it had been <laughs> all during rehearsal, Eamon had found this problem with her, that every time he asked about me as a young actor, she would burst into tears. And she said, you know, you know don't worry, I'll control it. I'll, 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 when, when he's on, I'll, I'll be able to control it. Well, of course, she didn't. She, she didn't exactly break down into tears, but she did find it difficult getting out the words. And the other um, slightly embarrassing moment was uh, they brought on a gentleman that I didn't recognise. Uh, and it was from my days when I did uh, Fit Up in 1952. So this was 20 odd years ago. And uh, they, 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 what I didn't, I recognised his face, but I didn't recognise his name. 
And so in my, although I was putting on, oh my goodness, they brought, inside I was thinking, who the hell is this? Who the hell is it? And then once he came on, I was okay. But that, well, that was the only scary moment I had because everybody else, Moira Lister, and John Chapman, John Slater, you know, I, I recognized Tony Hilton, who I wrote one for the pot with, uh, I recognized all those, but this guy, to start with, I, I didn't recognize his name and my tummy was going bang bang. So, well, I was all right. It's quite moving, actually. It is, you know, and of course, I've forgotten to mention my two lovely aunts, Auntie Rosie and Auntie, apart from my lovely, well, my mum and dad. And to see my mum, who, you know, spent all her life, or not all her life, but ever since she was uh, 17 in a wheelchair, she was a great lady. I think I get some of my, my guts from her. And I'm so thrilled that they, uh, that mum, because she only, she died when she was only 64, but I was so thrilled that she lived long enough to see me have uh, success. It was just a wonderfully happy occasion, and to be, I do, and of course I do, bringing our kids on when they were, when I look at it now and see them when they were just, you know, what, Michael was really a baby, and uh, Danny didn't want to come on, the elder boy didn't, didn't want to come on, and uh, Linda had to take him out of school, she went to collect him from school, she told, told the school what was happening. And they said, yes, of course, yeah, oh God, what a wonderful honour, yeah, of course. And he, he, he was saying, no, I don't want to go, Mum, I don't want to go. I think it, it must have been, I don't, don't know about the viewing figures, but I imagine it, it's been one of the most popular television programmes ever. It's so truthful, and I think the audience, uh, because it wasn't always about people who had a, a, a name in their business, it was sometimes about quite ordinary people. Uh, they got to know these people through their associations with, with, the, with the guests, and I think it was, you know, it was, uh, it was like a predecessor to reality television, uh, but, but real, and it could be quite emotional at times. It was a terrific programme. Well, I've never considered this before, but I suppose if you, to put it into context, it's one of the loveliest things that ever happened. And it's a total, as I've indicated earlier on, it's a total, absolute surprise. You don't expect, on the spur of the moment, to be whipped into a television studio and suddenly say, Ray Cooney, this is your life. It's right out of left field. and. Uh, it's the sort of thing you'll never experience again. It's, you know, it's, it's, well, it's well there, even though, but it's wonderful, to, like this conversation now, to, to talk about it and to be reminded about it. Because it's something that's, that's happened, it's in the past, and I'm a great one for not <laughs> dwelling on the past. I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing this afternoon or tomorrow morning at rehearsal. So it's just lovely to, to have that in one's memory. And again, I suppose you've got to consider it didn't happen to everybody. So I'm one in 1100, that's not bad. So I have ha I've had a terrific career and I th uh, Eamon, I think, summed it up. Uh, I think he went over the top a bit, <laughs> but uh, no, I I've been a lucky guy. Uh, when I say it makes me feel special, I don't mean it makes me feel like a hero or anything. It just uh, makes me feel as though I've done something with my life that was worthwhile being recognised.